Around 2008, I was finishing my term as director of the School of Resource and Environmental Management, and a fellow named Eric Peterson came to talk to me and said he'd uh, purchased a remote fly-in fishing lodge on the central coast of BC that he wanted to turn into a research station. And was I interested in working with him to do that? Uh, we spent a lot of time talking. Uh, he is a remarkable guy, uh, a real visionary, and has created something pretty amazing there. Uh, it's changed the nature of, of research in coastal British Columbia. And I'm pleased and proud to have been a part of helping make it happen. Uh, one of the things that, that the Tula Foundation, that he and his wife, Christina Monk, run funded in, initially in that was a research network that was based out of SFU, the Hakai Network for Coastal Peoples, Ecosystems and Management, mm -hmm. of which I was uh, initially co-director and then director. Mm -hmm. And we were interested in working with the indigenous communities on the Central Coast and everybody else that was there, but it's mostly indigenous communities there. Mm -hmm. They're the dominant numerically, and it's it's all their territory. This is the Great Bear Rainforest. It's a part of the Great Bear Rainforest, so there's a long history of uh, disputes and dispute resolution uh, in the context of forest practices there. Uh, it's a world-famous kind of case study of ecosystem-based management. But ecosystem-based management is a lot easier to talk about than it is to do, so we were interested in helping figure out how to actually make this happen on the ground. A lot of my role there I described as being air traffic controller, uh, finding P researchers to match with important projects that needed to be done, both on the science end and the social science end, and uh, making sure that things were happening. The part of it that then became closest to my own research uh, was what grew into the Quaxua watersheds, Quaxua Watershed Ecosystems Project. Um, the, the research station there is on a narrow channel in some outer coastal islands. There's a, it's like a lab rat for understanding these wet temperate rainforest watersheds and how they interact with the nearby ocean. And there's a large group of people that are, that are part of this. Um, I'd say that my biggest contribution was having the vision that to really understand the system, we needed everybody from plant ecologists and to soils people and geographers and hydrologists and biogeochemists and oceanographers to try and take a big picture look at how these ecosystem functions, these ecosystem function. Uh, it's a, the temperate rainforest is a very wet environment uh, the flow of water through the system from the rainfall through the stream, the forest soils to the stream network and out to the ocean is a dominant process on the landscape. And yet in these remote areas, it's a hard thing to study. It's uh, something that requires different disciplines uh, with different kinds of skills, different analytical techniques. And it's hard to get there. It's expensive to get there. It's hard to work there. You need to get around by boat or by airplane. Uh, there's no trails, there's no roads. Uh, it's cold and wet and stormy in the winter. Uh, it's been remarkable. The, the, Hakai Net Re the Hakai Institute now it's called, based there, has enabled a remarkable amount of research that has looked at these systems throughout the year with research happening during the biggest storms of the year and the winter. And the kinds of things we've shown is that these big pulsed episodic events, uh, the big storms make a huge difference in structuring the ecology of how the forests and the streams and the nearby ocean are integrated. We've known for a long time, not from my work, from other work, that uh, in the temperate rainforest, Marine nitrogen is carried by the salmon up into the streams and then out into the forest by bears and wolves and birds. And that marine nitrogen is a huge subsidy to the growth of the coastal forests. What we're beginning to understand is that terrestrial carbon, uh, the carbon that is fixed by the plants in the rainforest, 
and is flushed by the rainfall into the soils and then into the streams and carried by the streams down to the ocean, that this terrestrial carbon also plays a big role in the nearshore marine environment. And this is true in many places around the world, but the coastal temperate rainforests of the central coast of BC north through southeast Alaska are really a global hotspot for the flow of terrestrial carbon into the marine environment. And it's been, for me, it's been very exciting to be part of this diverse team of people who are teasing apart different parts of this, this system, different parts of the problem, and starting to build some understanding of how it fits all fits back together. Um, the other role for me in this is, again, this is not primarily, I, I mean, I, I'm, I've been the air traffic controller, but this is uh, the work of many people beyond me. Uh, uh, Kira Hoffman's research on fires in, in this forest, her PhD work, looking at, uh, though this is a very wet environment, there's been a ton of fire there over the last 10,000 years. Probably almost all of it associated with people on the landscape, using fire as a management tool to change the nature of the bog forest ecosystems, to influence it, and probably sometimes unintentionally as well. Uh, when you see charcoal on the ground there, it doesn't tell you, it tells you that it's charcoal and it tells you you can get a radiocarbon date on it. It doesn't tell you who lit the fire, what started the fire, was it lightning or people?